Living the Faith podcast, brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media, restoringthefaith.com. Welcome back to another episode of Living the Faith, coming at you from the heart of America. Again, both wherever your podcasts are found, in the Stitcher, Apple, and Android universe, as well as broadcasting in high-fidelity video in our illustrious Restoring the Faith set. Here today we have Mike, Joe, and Tom, and we are, we've are we put our heart into this, haven't we, Tom? That's absolutely true. Um, it's funny that you say that what, with June coming up and all. and You'll see why in a second. Yeah, well, so we put our heart into it, and someone else has put their heart into something, and we want to talk about the hearts today. What is it about the heart that has been, in all times, in all places, by all peoples, a sign, a symbol of someone's intentionality, someone's emotions, the, the, the very essence of a person? In fact, the symbol of love, really. No doubt. The, but that is universally understood by all peoples in all places. And it's just such an interesting thing. The heart has always been a symbol, not only of love, but of the very essence of a person. And we want to talk about today, a very specific heart. And we're talking about a very tangible heart. In fact, a physical heart, right? And that would be the physical heart of the human person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the subject of today's talk the sacred heart of Jesus. So, Joe, first 10 centuries, pretty scarce evidence of a devotion to the sacred heart. Mm-hmm. Number of reasons for that, right? Certainly. Um, some among them, uh, Tom, I believe that you were talking about them before, of just even the symbol of the cross being a bit scarce. Uh, in, the, in the earlier centuries, it was more focused on the ictus, the fish symbol. Exactly. Um, and then you're saying, was it sometime after Constantine? Exactly. So after Constantine, so uh, in the same in the same analogy that the early Christians in the first in the first few hundred years of the church didn't really use the cross as a symbol of Christianity because it was a symbol of torture and of of punishment. And so it took it took that time for the cross to lose its stigma, let's say, mm-hmm. of of pain and suffering, and then become recognized as a symbol of triumph. So it'd be. For example, you made the, you made a comparison. It'd be like us saying, "Oh, you know, our God died in the electric chair, so we're going to put an electric chair on, as a symbol of our things." Today, for modern people, that's really, really weird, and that's exactly how people in the in the day felt. So now, when you talk about about the heart, um, people people didn't really understand understand anatomy and the structure back then, and so you know, your heart certainly they understood that everyone had a heart, but it's it's a muscle. It's like a stomach or something. So why is this why is this attractive? And so it took oh. it took some time to to understand the symbolism behind it. I think so. That's why it's it was vague, scarce in the first. And I think there centuries. were uh, there were also other um, other details about our Lord's heart, his his human heart, his physical real heart that we knew. We knew that it was pierced by a lance. We knew that that ultimately was his earthly demise, right, and his descent into hell. Um, and so why would you, uh, to your point, why would you venerate such a, such an organ? Why would you, why would you take the organ? Now, um, first 10 centuries, what we do have, what we have seen was a devotion to the five wounds of Jesus and chiefly among them or within those five wounds would be the opening of his side and the letting out of the, of his blood and water. Um, very symbolic. And so we know that his heart was pierced. We know that his heart, his his heart, uh, Jesus wept. He wept for Lazarus. He wept multiple times in the gospels. And so we know that his, his human heart really did feel human emotions. And to be sure, um, that, that has a symbology all of, all within itself. So all right, so we're in the 10th and 11th century, pious traditions in the early Middle Ages, here we are. Um, and but like by the 12th century, you have all of a sudden you have hymns and you have offices devoted to the heart of Jesus. You, you don't yet have what we understand today to be the sacred heart of, of Jesus, the, de- the devotion that we know today. Um, but you have many, many different players around Christendom, right? So this spanned 
a, geogra- a geography of France and Belgium and Germany and Italy, and it was it was it was it was coming up in all of these orders too: the Carthusians and the Benedictines, the Cistercians, the Franciscans. Um, you had Saint Boniface, one of the great saints that we should probably do a whole show about. Just Saint Boniface, who was advocating for this particular devotion. Um, and there's this really interesting story um, about Saint Lucred, right? Am I saying that right? Lucred, yep. So Saint Lucred, um, sh- she was a mystic, and our Lord appeared to her and 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 said, um, you know, what is it, my daughter, that you desire of me? And she replies to our Lord, and she says, you know, I I would really like to have, I struggle with Latin, and and, <laughs> I, <we> all. <laughs> and I want to be literate, because, you know, that's the oh, that was the currency of the day, to be literate. If you wanted to read the scriptures, or the antiphons, or the hymns, you had to read Latin. And so she requested this gift of our Lord, which of course he gave to her, and even though her mind was filled with all these beautiful and profound thoughts and she was flooded with these images that she suddenly had access to, she felt this profound emptiness inside of her. And our Lord came back to her and he said, my daughter, what is it? What is it that troubles you? And she said, well, if I could just give you back this gift that you gave me and ask for another. And he said, ask, ask away. And she said, I want your heart. And he reached into his body and he pulled out his heart and he reached into her body and he pulled out her heart and he exchanged them. Wow. And if you think about the symbolism behind that, what she really asked for at the beginning was the gift of knowledge and of understanding. Yeah. And she realized that was not what was truly important, but instead love was more important. Sure. And if you think about it from the from the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, that in heaven there is no faith because, of course, you see. You see everything. And there is, there is no need for faith. There's no hope because you have either achieved or not achieved the beatific mm-hmm. vision, and there only remains charity, love of God. And in fact, that's really what, what the beatific vision is all about, is this this love of God. So really it's... And, it, and, and in the same for the, in the garden, again, it's a, a warped view of it, but not, um, love was forsaken in the name of knowledge, even with, uh, yeah. w- with that. So yeah. there, there's definitely a hierarchy. It's not to say that knowledge is an evil thing or a bad thing or anything like that. There's just something that is even even greater. Sure. And knowledge knowledge really is precedence to some of the other uh, virtues as well. If you have no knowledge of a thing, then how can you how can you appreciate its beauty or its goodness or its truth? So you have to, it's, it's, it's a prerequisite, but I think that that was our Lord's big um, problem with the Pharisees is that they just rested in their knowledge. They knew the law to the letter and, but there was no charity there. There was no love. And, you know, so Certainly. that was, that was sort of a waste. Okay. So then we're moving forward in time and within the middle ages, this is spreading out mostly from the monastic lifestyle, this, this um, devotion to the physical, real substantial heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then what happens? St. Margaret Mary appears on the scene. And what happens there, Joe? This is next level for the devotion to the Sacred Heart. This is uh, St. Margaret Mary Alcoke is is really the reason why we have a devotion to the Sacred Heart today. Um, several things came out of that, and I can explain that, but just a little bit of background. So uh, she received her first Holy Communion at nine years old. And after that time... Um, she, uh, did a lot of penance, severe, severe mortification, um, for a, to, to such a point that she was actually confined, um, with rheumatism in her bed to, for four years. Oh boy. And so after this period of four years or whatnot and, and all this suffering again, so she would have been what, 13 years old at this time, she makes a promise to the immaculate. Uh, heart that she will um, join the convent, that she will dedicate her life to the religious life uh, if she's cured. And so she is healed. Um, and so this is when she adds the name Mary to the end of her, or uh, to her baptismal name. 
So, you know, it's a little bit interesting because you never seem to, you can't really say St. Margaret. Nobody knows who you're talking about when you say St. Margaret, but you yeah. say St. Margaret Mary. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. okay, got I know it. Who that is, yeah. Right. So she's not St. Margaret Mary without the name Mary, right? So this is, this is the significance and the importance um, that she had for that name. The interesting thing about it, though, you know, you hear about, you know, people who are born saints. Um, and uh, she was definitely a holy little girl, but then she soon forgot this promise um, to join the uh, the convent. And, uh, so she actually, uh, th- there's a problem in their family where, uh, one of her relatives actually took away all the family's wealth. Her family was destitute. Um, they regained that. And then her mother said, okay, now that we're back in the game here, I need you to go get married. You know? So she sent, um, her out with her brothers to all these balls and social events and whatnot. And she's dressing very beautifully and would, that, that's a good thing in and of itself, obviously, but she was just she's participating. preparing for her vocation. Right. She's preparing for a vocation that's not the religious life. And um, she was just, she, she had justified it to herself in her head that, you know, she was young. She made a vow when she was 13 years old. This is, you know, that was not binding, yeah. you know, et cetera. And then she, she came home one day from this ball and uh, our Lord appears to her scourge uh, in, in bloody and in, just in a terrible condition and in this condition reproaches her for forgetfulness of her promise, um, to, uh, join the religious life. So she immediately, wow. um, repents. Can you imagine you make this promise when you're 13 and you think, well, it's not, that's puppy love. Yeah. That's not a real, that's not binding. I didn't swear an oath. And then our, our Lord appears to you and holds you accountable to that. Can you imagine the shame that you would feel in that moment? Absolutely, yeah. No, it was it was it was pretty horrendous according to the account for sure. So she joined the convent when she was twenty four. Um, so she just quickly went over, got rid of everything, and went to the went to the convent. And then she starts going through. Uh, our Lord appears to her again, coming back to her. Uh, you know, obviously pleased that she has now taken her. Uh, vow seriously yeah and now she is, he begins to give her these revelations sure and um one of the direct requests uh and he's in, enshrining this concept of the sacred heart which again is a devotion that had been developing um but like the rosary for example when you know our lady gave it to saint dominic our Lord is now taking a devotion that that had taken some t- taken grasp, and there was some devotion to this. But He was like, "No, I love this devotion, and now I'm going to um, establish this truly." Mm-hmm. And so there was a couple things that came out of that. There was the concept of the first Friday. Um, I don't know, Mike. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, so on the first Friday of the month, um, if you uh, attend Mass, and I think you have to, you go to confession and you and you say a, a certain number of prayers, both for the intentions of the of the Church and for the Pope. Um, then you know that's that fulfills your your duty, but you you want to do it nine times in a year, and, and not just and not just any nine times, but it has to be nine consecutive times. So, for right. example, if you do January, February, March, and skip April, you have to start that's again. It. You have to start over again. And you would be surprised how difficult that is. I mean, look, especially in the modern world where you know we we have global travel and we have business meetings and and we and we're busy and we have children who have you know events and things. To, to go nine consecutive times. I mean, you really have to say to yourself, this is the year that I'm going to do it. So what you're saying is is that there's a lot of events that take place on a, uh, the first Friday of a month, generally speaking, in, sure. some, in most people's social calendars. Sure, yeah. Yeah. No, it's just, it's, 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 no, 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 really. It's I mean, it's just, no, no, it, it, it always does. It's, it always it's, does. Because I've yeah. never done it. I've never been able to finish them. Um, I don't have, have you been able to finish them? Okay. So. My parents, my parents did it when we were all very young. And so we all, we did it every year for, I think five or six years until all of us as until children had made it. So that's great. That's, that's, wow. that's and fantastic. The, and the first Saturdays too. So we'd go to mass Friday and Saturday. And well, it sounds an awful lot like bragging and cheating now, well, but, but they know. knew, but, but actually no, <laughs> it's not, it's not due to me. It's my mm. parents. Like, well, I they, can, they knew that Tom was going to be this like world traveling globetrotter. And so they knew, okay, this is our one chance because once he's gone, open right now. He's I gone. will tell you yeah. that it would be very difficult for me to do that Yeah, any any year, really any month. Mm-hmm. Very difficult. But again, it sounds like such a low bar and it sounds so easy to do. And here in our culture, 
it's not an easy thing to do, and it takes intentionality. It takes it, it takes a concerted effort of the will to do that. And so, Mike, it's not just a question of oh, I'm going to go to mass on mass and fulfill the other obligations and so on for the first for nine months and do this the the first Fridays just because I feel like it or whatever. Of course, certainly because it's a great devotion and all, but there are a lot of promises attached to benefits if you do fulfill these nine yeah, first Fridays. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to read them um, as they are. And these, and are the, these, are, these were the these promises? Are the, these are the promises of the Sacred Heart of Jesus made specifically to Margaret Mary. And we're going to pull up her image here as we read. I will give them all the graces necessary to their state in life. I will establish peace in their homes. I will comfort them in their afflictions. I will be their secure refuge during life and above all in death. Very important. I will bestow abundant blessings upon their undertakings. Sinners will find in my heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy. Lukewarm souls shall be fervent. Fervent sh- souls shall quickly mount to high perfection. I will bless every place in which an image of my heart is exposed and honored, which we're going to get to that. I will give to priests the gift of touching the most hardened hearts. Um, that's pretty cool. Those who shall promote this devotion shall have their names written in my heart, which is precisely why we're doing this show. So now we're written in the heart, hopefully. Um, And number 12, this is a longer one. I promise you in the excessive mercy of my heart that my all-powerful love will grant to all those who receive Holy Communion on the first Fridays in nine consecutive months the grace of final perseverance. They shall not die in my disgrace nor without receiving their sacraments. My divine heart shall be their safe refuge in this last moment. That is a very specific promise that our Lord gave to Margaret Mary to give to the world. So what you're trying to tell me is is that there are basically nine consecutive first Fridays between me and guaranteed heaven. That's but the a, whole, that's a plain reading of the word, but I don't, you and, know. I, and so at the same time, <laughs> you, it, it's easy to it's easy to get a little towards the superstitious and say, oh, well, the brown scapular. I wear the brown scapular and guarantee I'm not going to hell because wearing the scapular will not suffer eternal fire. So if you go swimming, I can't take my scapular off because what if I drown? Sure. Go, to, go to hellfire. The whole point is supposed to be you wear this as a sign of you wear this, you have this devotion as a sign of your habitual state of mind. That's right. And so the you're point should be you're supposed to be in the state of grace. You wouldn't. You're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to say the daily rosary. Exactly. You know, there, there are conditions. There's, there's some fine print here. Sure, sure. <laughs> but, right. but yes, assuming all those conditions, that's a pretty amazing promise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, this is and probably well worth. The, this, with regards to divine mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is by far the most spectacular promise ever, ever given to mankind. And it has reverberated throughout the centuries. So there's some sim- symbolism and theology reg- with regards to this devotion that, um, that we, we should touch on briefly. We alluded to it in, in the intro. What is the heart? You know, the heart is, is your essence. It's, it's your love. And our Lord's heart is a symbol of his incomparable and incomprehensible love that he has for his creatures. He, he possessed a physical human heart mm-hmm. for us. It was pierced and, and spat upon and disregarded for us. And when he appears, he still has the wound in his side. Mm-hmm. And, he'll, and, he, and he even lets Thomas see it mm-hmm. and place his hand and his fingers through the holes in his hands. So, but let's not also, also forget though that it's not just a symbol of love, but it is also this very symbol of life, right? I mean, this is very good. It, it, it's also that as well. I mean, we talk about the uh, the 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 Christ is the way, the truth, and the truth, and the life. Sure. I mean, that is also the same symbol that. We describe that by that. This is what breathes air into our lungs. Whenever you talk about, you know, all these people in the world today, you know, they talk about, well, he died like twice. And you're like, I'm, I'm sorry, what? Uh, oh, well, his heart, his heart stopped beating. And so people already have that connection, right? That Again, is the medical is, definition right, of, medical of life definition. and death. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. the distinction. Yeah. If your heart stops, it's over. Gone. They don't measure it by brain waves. No. Which may be more accurate, who knows, but they measure it by the heartbeat. If mm-hmm. you have a... Flat line, that's it. Yep. The only response to love is love. 
right? When somebody loves you, the only response to that is to return that love. And that's really like the key and the essence of understanding the Trinity. And that's also the key in understanding this devotion to our Lord's sacred heart, because his heart was pierced for us out of love. And so what do we owe him? And what does he tell, what does he tell Margaret Mary in terms of what is so saddening to him? What pains his sacred heart? It's the ingratitude of man. It's not, and, and, and I think Fulton Sheen makes this point too. It's really fascinating that it's not the anger of man. It's not the atheist, right, that, that annoys him as much. It's not the person who comes to hate God, who says, how could you have sent this chastisement to me? I am mad with you. Because at least those people have passion. They have some level of passion for God. It's the absolute disregard yeah. for God. And from, from a theological standpoint, the absolute worst, there, there's love, there's hatred. But hatred is a perversion of love, and so it is love in a certain sense. Sure. And so if you love someone, that's obviously you love someone. If you hate someone, you're at a different level, but worse than hatred is indifference because you don't even care. Right. Hatred right. is better than indifference. So that's yeah. while while it's very astounding, point. it it kind of makes sense. Hatred is a recognition still of the goodness of that person if that person Exactly, because if I if I hate you, it means I deep down I see something and so there's something for me to dislike because there is some type of good. But if it's indifference, yeah. I've you you have ceased to exist in my mind, and so it it's a sort of a mental atheism, if you will. Sure, God does not exist. Yep. don't even don't even think about it. Yep, or or even so, an acknowledgement that he exists, but it's like so what? Exactly. So, um, our Lord asks this question, right? And this is not um, a hypothetical question that he asks. Um, he says, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that really is 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 what a huge differentiator, I think, between the Catholic faith and and our 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 Protestant brothers, who unfortunately are totally separated from the truth of the church, because it's not just this sappy kind of like hallmark love, this emotion. Okay, like I love, I develop this love and affection for our Lord. There's an action involved too. If you love me, keep my commandments. Do something about it. Right. And so I think that I think that as you think about the sacred heart of Jesus, it's yeah. OK, you got to do something. You got to show up nine times in a row. You have to rearrange your life, your social calendar. You have to prioritize me. You have to demonstrate to me that you love me. It's not just, hey, amen. I accept you mm -hmm. as my savior. Uh, and, and so following after that, that is obviously the greatest one. But for some solace as well on Earth, for some. Uh, comfort in this valley of tears that we live in. I, I love the the second promise. Of co course, it was clearly important for Christ to even make it a promise and to make it important, but was peacefulness in the homes. Yeah. How many homes, how many homes do you have a lack of peace in the home? How, let me put it this way. How many homes have you walked in and you said, this is a peaceful home? Yeah, right. Peace. How how well do you know your friends and whatnot and whatnot? You 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 have conversations. Guys have their talk. You know, women talk about the things that you know trouble them at their home. There's always some, uh, in, especially in this world where we ha the the sexes have been literally set up upon each other. Yeah. To to men be against women and women be against men and whatnot. And you bring two people who truly love themselves in the home, but they're still affected by the world. Right. How much more important in a world like this where we have to raise children yes. for the greater honor and glory of God, that we need to actually make an effort to make these First Fridays for just the sake of the peace in the home, for the sure. sake of the children. That's a great motivator. I mean, look, when you think about the word peace, most people say peace is the absence of conflict. And if that's the definition, then there's peace in the Middle East because there's no <laughs> conflict going on, right? It's but nobody would say that there's peace in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The theological definition of peace is, tr is the tranquility of order. Mm. And when you step into a home that, it, that has the tranquility of order, where there is tranquility and order, that's a very calming thing. That's a, that's a, very, that's a very rare thing, if mm. we're being honest, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because you've got, you've got 
a ton of frantic families and within the conservative Catholic world, you know, where we've all got a bunch of young children and it's it and life just seems to be moving so fast. And especially if you homeschool, it seems like there's this huge burden upon you to school the children. And then, but also I'm trying to feed them and also I'm trying to clean up after them. And also I'm trying to instill discipline in them. And there's just, there's not this tranquility of order and, our Lord promises that he can give that to you. I mean, how powerful is that? It's truly amazing. And so that, that kind of leads us into the final point of the show where we discuss how do you properly implement this in your life? What are the proper celebrations of the feast? We know that the feast is sort of a floating feast. It depends on when other, it's, it's, it's relative to other feasts. So it's fixed mm -hmm. as 19 days after the feast of Corpus Christi. And that happens to fall always on a Friday. And so on the Friday of, uh, the, of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, if you have not enthroned your home, Joseph, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I missed your enthronement, mm -hmm. and I'm still sorry about that, but why don't you tell us how, how it went down? Um, so, yes, it's, it's a very uh, beautiful um, uh, tradition. To you, um, the, the priest comes into your home, and he will um, bless the home. He will bless the statue of the image um, that you will be um, using as the as the symbol of that enthronement, that m reminder, that constant reminder that this home belongs to Christ's sacred heart, as Christ the King of your home. Um, we're very, very beautiful statue. We're very fortunate to find a very beautiful statue of Christ holding the cross with the the, the triple crown, with also the sacred heart. Um, and, um, our priest came and he blessed the statue and then we had a throne set up for him over our mantelpiece. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. we, this was like actually my first, my wife's and I's first project together where we built a throne, uh, with fabrics and, and woods yeah. and stuff like this. And this was before this the thing. tranquility of order set in. Exactly. So, there was an adventure. We're still working <laughs> on the tranquility of order. We're still working on that. Uh, but it, it's, it was it was a beautiful first step though, and again, this is the first thing that we see in the morning. It just so happens that yeah. coming in and out of the house, that is the the the, the thing that you are faced with constantly is yeah, Christ up center. high yeah. on his throne. It's not with the television. Exactly, it's really strange. There's no television yeah, out well. there, but yeah, um, big one downstairs. Side point. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a set of prayers, and you, and then the the priest will actually put in throne. Christ on his, on the pedestal or on the throne or whatever place that you've selected um, and placing this. And then oftentimes, or you should have a certificate of an yeah. enthronement. And then this is something that you would frame and that you would put up on your wall. Um, I, I hope that we will very soon uh, have released our catalog where we'll give you a downloadable certificate that you can then have your priest sign. Well, actually it's not the, it's not a priest. Well, you can't, you can't have the priest sign it. I, I'm oh, sure the father, yes. but it, there's a special Monsignor who's a delegate from the Pope. Um, I want to say one of the passionist fathers um, from the passionist order in Rome really? who has the authority of the papal blessing and it's their special mission to promote this. And I, and I could be getting the religious order wrong because um, I, I have to check it again, but I do know that on the back of that certificate, it should be signed at least a facsimile signature of this rep authorized representative. And it's in a similar sense, it's like having the Stations of the Cross hung Certainly. by the Franciscans that mm. by, by extension, they can give permission to other religious to, to enthrone, to, to um, forget the word, to, to mount the Stations of the Cross. But it's an extra blessing on top of that. And that, that now your name is in a, in a register in Rome of that your house has been enthroned. So there's some actual legal paperwork that, you know, much like a marriage or a baptism mm. or something like that, mm. you're actually in the book of life, so to speak. Wow. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty beautiful. Me, get me one of those. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we should find that resource and, and pass it along. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that'll be posted on the website. I mean, so look, here we are at uh, at Restoring the Faith Media. This is the Living the Faith show, and we are coming at you again from our studio here. And what we want to convey to our audience is there's plenty of time before June 28th. June 28th, 2019 is the Feast of the Sacred Heart. The most traditional and beautiful thing that you can do is enthrone our Lord. Lord and his sacred heart in your home, sign the certificate, and make your preparations to make those nine consecutive Sundays. God love you. Living the Faith Podcast. 
Brought to you by Restoring the Faith. Living the Faith Podcast. Brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media. Restoringthefaith.com.